You can be taking a statin drug and have a normal cholesterol or great cholesterol on a statin drug and still have a heart attack. Right now, we still have 40% of Americans dying of heart attacks in spite of everybody on drugs for their heart, for statin, you know, lowering their cholesterols. They're taking statins, they're taking blood pressure medications, they're lowering their cardiovascular risk factors, and the risk of heart attack is the same and they're not living longer. They're not living longer, they're not having fewer heart attacks, and they're not seeing any, th any benefit except for seeing better short-term endpoints so they, so they think they're looking better on paper. So we're moving forward where we left off, and we're talking about preventing and reversing diseases in a little more detail. You know, not be totally comprehensive with certain elements, which we're, because we still have lectures tomorrow about cooking, and more lectures tomorrow about um, the various anti-cancer effects of various foods and how foods work to prevent cancer and, and even treat cancer. So that's going to be more tomorrow, and then so now we're going more about other diseases, not, as, not about cancer so much right now, more like heart disease and diabetes and autoimmune conditions right now. So let's move forward with that. And just want to start out that somewhat continues where we were discussing before, how what you eat affects the brain. And I just want to make, it, make the clear point that the gut inflammation is linked to brain inflammation. And you can't have gut inflammation without brain inflammation or brain inflammation without gut inflammation because the whole body is, is connected in a way. You know, and when you have toxins permeating the lining of the digestive tract, it's very often meningeal membranes of the brain is affected and even brain cells, you can have more inflammation in brain cells. So sugar not only increases insulin, but IGF-1 and then the glucose spikes that suppress the immune system and reduces surveillance of abnormal cells, interferes with the body's ability to identify abnormal cells, precancerous cells and cancerous cells, and cause apoptosis. Apoptosis is the identification and destruction of cells that are abnormal that could lead to cancer or may already be cancerous. So these cells, their surfaces get to be distorted and the immune system can recognize the distorted cell surface that represents an abnormal cell, and then the immune system has the natural killer T cells that can attack this. So there's this interrelationship between the immune system's ability to surveil cells and the inflammation of the immune system and the inflammation of the gut that can interfere with the immune system's ability to seek out and destroy abnormal cells. Lastly, Gene silencing means that when you're exposed to sufficient nutrients in your diet, especially phytochemicals and particularly green vegetables, we can silence the genes that are abnormal that would normally lead to cancer. So abnormal genes may be genetic or acquired. They're not a substantial contrib contribution to serious illness and death because they're silenced by good nutrition. Nutrition still overwhelms genetics. It's only when you have poor nutrition that abnormal genes can be activated. Furthermore, I'm making it clear that sweets and meats create the growth of more pro-inflammatory and pathogenic bacteria in the gut and produce more yeast forms in the gut. And that inflammation that occurs from the, you could say, the chronic inflammation in the digestive tract from poor foods, the overgrowth of unhealthy bacteria, of course, leads to digestive impairment, but it also leads to people getting headaches all the time and developing migraine syndromes. So the pro-inflammatory diet leads to them developing headaches and migraines as well. So I'm showing this slide, which was first published in my book, Eat to Live, in 2004, which tracked how much produce was eaten by various countries around the world. Now, don't forget, this produce consumption was countries before 1970 when most of these countries were still eating a lot of produce. Right now, obviously, we can't duplicate this slide in the year 2000, 2010, or 220 because we've exported American way of life, and there's no countries around the world that are eating a diet with so many fruits and vegetables, let's say. But back in the, you know, back 50 years ago, there were populations still eating a healthy amount of fruits and vegetables, and the amount of unrefined plant foods they consumed was directly related to these diseases of nutritional extravagance or these modern killer diseases we see in America today and in, and in Europe, which are mostly and across much of the world, which are heart attacks, 
strokes and cancers kill more people, and heart attacks are still the number one cause of death for heart attacks and strokes are still the number one cause of death for both men and women, and heart attacks overwhelm strokes um, for both sexes, and that obviously it's a leading cause of death for people over the age of 65, way and way above, way and above cancer. So it's still most, most men with prostate cancer die of heart attacks, by the way, not prostate cancer. But as you can see, that countries with low level of produce had high rates of heart attacks and strokes and cancers, and populations with high intake of produce had low rates of heart attacks and cancers. And the, I guess the point is, there are no healthy people in the world today like there used to be. There's some enclaves of good health, but there's a better health. But we've exported American way of life, so it, we're not even seeing areas of the world that are leading healthy today. And that's the, it shows you how incredibly powerful, the toxic and addictive this style of eating is that it's spread like an epidemic through the whole world and spiked cancers, cancers that never occurred before in various parts of the world, we're now seeing all over the world. And obesity and diabetes, which never occurred, you know, young people, we're seeing it in younger people and also in all populations the world over. And obesity and overweight people, which didn't exist all over the world, are now being seen all over the world. And keeping in mind, this is a disease of, the, of recent history. Look at the data in 1900 when only 4% of Americans die of heart attacks and strokes, and now it's more than 35%. See, the increased risk of diseases of the heart over the last 120 years, or, le or that's the last 100 years from 1900 to 2000. And of course, you see there's a little dip in the amount of deaths. And this actually parallels cancer growth and autoimmune system growth. There wasn't much autoimmune system or cancers as well, and it climbed in parallel to the waistlines and the access to processed foods. And, and of course, oil, you know, cooked oil consumption. But notice there was a dip around 1995, 2000. We actually had a dip in the death rate in America for two reasons predominantly. One is that doctors stopped prescribing estrogen for, for postmenopausal women. Because one of the major factors fueling the breast cancer epidemic was doctor prescriptions for estrogens. And then they woke up eventually, because doctors always were promoting estrogen for women. You know, wanting they, doctors want to give people stuff. It makes them feel important, like they're doing something. It attracts people and it, it attracts business if they can be writing prescriptions and having people needed to come back for their prescriptions. It's almost like the doctor's motivation is to keep you sick. They can keep prescribing. But there was so much data on estrogen use being leaked to breast cancer and increased heart attacks and strokes that they stopped prescribing estrogen and the death rates went down. Of course, a lot of the alternative medicine community tried to make money on that by trying to convince people that bioidentical estrogen is still okay. It can give you that. And so what are you talking about, bioidentical estrogen? Doesn't estrogen your own body produces cross breast cancer? Of course it does. The more estrogen like it is, the more dangerous it is. Why would it have something that's bioidentical not cause cancer? The extra fat on your body that raises your estrogen levels cause cancer. Bioidentical estrogen is not harmless. It causes, increases risk of breast cancer. Just like, anyway, the whole thing is ridiculous. And then when, when people stopped smoking, there was let, much less smoking reduced the amount of people who smoked in America also had an effect to reduce death rates from all causes. But then the onward march of the processed and fast food movement overtook those benefits. The waistlines of Americans continued to climb and the death rates and the premature death rates continued to climb and continued to get worse from the years 2000 to 2020. So even though there was a little dip where things got better for 10 years or so due to people stopping smoking and stop using it. Eventually climbed up and, oh, and got worse again. We're still not smoking as much, but we're eating worse than we were, essentially. And you can see that, these, that the fact that people still believe the nonsense that breast cancer is genetic, in spite of the fact that it never occurred in human history until recently, and most of the modern world didn't develop breast cancer until after the 1960s, See, even in China and Japan, in Mexico and Dominican Republic, there was only one-tenth the amount of breast cancer in the United States back in 1967. And then, of course, we exported American way of life. And in South Korea, there was one-fifteenth the amount of breast cancer in 1960. And then they started becoming more linked to America with more fast food restaurants and more soft drinks and more hamburg um, hamburgers and pizza. And then their breast cancer rates went up 500% in South Korea, nearly approaching half as much, not one-fifteenth as much as the United States, but came up to one-half as much. And of course, when these people from other populations with very low rates of cancer, 
And there are populations in Mozambique and, and other parts of the world where they have 1 50th the amount of breast cancer as do in America. But those populations move to America, adopt the American style of eating, and they develop rates of breast cancer that's, in, that's consistent with the rate of people born in this country. So there's no genetic, there's no genetic difference here. The, the, recently, the medical profession was trying to understand the Hispanic paradox, which means that in food deserts across America, where there's such a high rate of disease, of diabetes and heart attacks and cancers, they looked and found that Hispanic individuals living in those areas didn't have as negative outcomes. And first they thought, as usual, the foolishness, thinking that, well, that's because there's something genetic that's protecting them. And then they found out, they went and got more data, and found out because even when that the overall Hispanic populations living in food deserts were still putting beans in their diet, they weren't just living on fast foods. Because of their, their heritage, their cultural heritage, they had more dishes with beans in it than the non-Hispanics had in food deserts. Did you follow that? Even in the nurses' health study in Boston, they found that um, beans were the food that had the most effect on reducing incidence of breast cancer in women, and that even just bean consumption three times a week, even three servings a week of beans, had a tremendous impact at lowering breast cancer rates just from three servings a week. The reason why they didn't show greens, even though I'm saying that green vegetables, and it doesn't, are more, or have more powerful anti-cancer chemicals than beans do, um, even though they both have a lot, um, it's irrelevant whether one is a little better than the other. It doesn't even matter because they're both powerful. But the reason why the nurses' health study didn't identify the greens and the green cruciferous as being so powerful against breast cancer is because no one, no, they had no population cohort that was eating a significant amount of green vegetables to show the effects of them. Almost the whole nursing co health study cohort only had people either eating beans or not eating beans, or not, they, none of them ate greens, enough sufficient greens to study. But in any case, I'm just demonstrating that breast cancer is not genetic, predominantly genetic. It's predominantly non-genetic. And even people with the BRCA1 gene and GSTP1 gene, it, that's those genes are suppressed by a high intake of green vegetables and green cruciferous vegetables. So Angelina Jolie did not need to cut her breasts off or take her ovaries out if she ate right, for example. This idea that you cut people apart, take out their ovaries, cut up their breasts, another thing that the medical profession does instead of having people eat right. So let's move on um, for a minute to the effectiveness of cholesterol methods like statin drugs because what I'm saying here is that a nutritarian diet was been studied by, the, by David Jenkins' group in the University of Toronto where they followed a, a period, people for a six-week period and it dropped their LDL cholesterol more than 33% more than statin drugs do and of course much more than a, than a low-fat vegetarian diet or, any, or another type of American Heart Association diet. But the point I'm making here, and a point I want to make here, is that get out of your head this idea that LDL cholesterol is the major factor causing or, or measuring your heart attack risk. It's not. There's a hundred different factors measuring your heart attack risk. And, you, and, and because the medical profession has a drug to lower LDL cholesterol, they get the population overly focused on LDL cholesterol. First of all, it's oxidized LDL that's the bad actor, much worse than L overall LDL, because the oxidation of LDL is what inflames the inner wall of the blood vessels causing heart attacks. And on this diet of that I'm recommending with all these antioxidants and phytochemicals, even if your LDL was somewhat in the elevated to a degree, your oxidized LDL would, would be super low because there won't be much oxidation of the LDL molecule. Furthermore, it's not just cholesterol, it's the overall inf inflammation, inflammatory effect of the diet, the, over, the high blood pressure, the body weight, and the quality of your diet. I'm saying to you right now is that I'm looking at a person's risk of heart attacks even if they have low cholesterol. I can analyze their diet and predict their risk of heart attack more from their dietary anal analysis than you can from what their blood analysis is. The dietary analysis is much more important, risk factor of heart disease, than the blood analysis. You can be taking a statin drug and have a normal cholesterol or great cholesterol on a statin drug and still have a heart attack. Right now, we still have 40% of Americans dying of heart attacks in spite of everybody on drugs for their heart, for statin, you know, lowering their cholesterols. They're taking statins, they're taking blood pressure medications, they're lowering their cardiovascular risk factors, and the risk of heart attack is the same and they're not living longer. They're not living longer, they're not having fewer heart attacks, and they're not 
seeing any any benefit except for seeing better short-term endpoints so they, so they think they're looking better on paper, but they're not better. And we could determine because they're still eating wrong, and the dietary negative overwhelms those beneficial pa things on your blood test anyway. Furthermore, we can look at your inflammatory mediators like HSCRP, high-sensitive CRP, C-reactive protein, or myeloperoxidase, or oxidized LDL. Those are all markers of how much free radicals you have circulating and how inf much inflammation in your endothelium. And the combination of those inflammatory markers are better predictors of having a future heart attack in the next month or day or week. You can actually see if you have a, a rising myeloperoxidase and CRP or these inflammatory markers are going up, the person's about to have a, gonna have a heart attack soon. And you can immediately stop the inflammatory markers by changing the way you eat within a week. And sure, a nutritarian diet lowers LDL cholesterol, but it also improves blood flow, makes the blood vessels more elastic, right? It floods the body with phytochemicals and antioxidants, lowers your pulse, you know, keeps your pulse pressure more narrow. There's a, a lot of different things that, of course, protect the heart and make the heart work less, lowers the viscosity of the blood, you know, prevents the rouleau formation of red blood cells. The rouleau formation means the red blood cells, stickiness of the red blood cells, the stickiness of the platelets hugging onto each other. Is a whole bunch of things that are mechanical and biological factors that are improving and reducing risk of heart disease, not just the one issue of lowering the LDL. I'd rather you have a higher LDL and do all the other parameters right than just have a low LDL and do all the parameters wrong. Are you following this? Now, here's a study on... 400, about 440 people following a nutritarian diet for six months, and the average person dropped their systolic blood pressure by 26 points, went from 147 on the average to 121, and that was not quite accurate because they removed the medic. The doctors were taking people off their medications as they were getting the new blood pressure readings. So because their blood pressure was lowering, the doctors took away their medications so they were 147 on the average on medication and 121 off medications, which mean the blood pressure lowering effect wasn't really 26 points. If they were on the same amount of medication or there were no medications, it would have been much greater than 26 point lowering. You following that? Like they did, they always write in Newsweek or in you know, different or, um, media outlets, write that the DASH diet, the low sodium DASH diet is the most beneficial effect, the best diet for blood pressure lowering. Well, that only lowered blood pressure, the low sodium DASH diet by 11%. And, they had, and, the, and the medication or non-medication use were not changed. This is with the medications taking away, but lowered it by 26%. Nobody considers this being the most effective blood pressure and heart disease reversal program, even though it is by far, nothing's even close. The, the doctors in the American Heart Association and the American, um, and the American College of Cardiology recommends people with heart disease cut their sodium intake back to 1,500 milligrams a day, commensurate with what the DASH diet recommendations are, but that's, other, that's kind of a ridiculous statement. Let me explain why it's a ridiculous statement. If it was advisable to cut people's um, with heart disease amount of sodium down to 1,500 milligrams a day, then why wouldn't they recommend the general population do that? Why would they recommend only people with heart disease cut their sodium back to 1,500 milligrams? It makes no sense at all. That's like saying... People who develop lung cancer or COPD from cigarette smoking should cut out cigarette smoking. No, you shouldn't wait till people get sick and then cut out the cigarette smoking. You should cut out the cigarette smoking before they get sick. It makes no sense for a cardiologist to tell people to cut that out. It should be, it should be something that's educated to the entire population to not to develop heart disease or high blood pressure. Do you want, understand what I'm saying? It's not logical. It's completely illogical. You don't wait till a person gets sick to, to fix their parameters. Number two... The studies don't show 1,500 milligrams of the optimal blood per, um, intake of sodium. All the studies show reduction of heart attack and stroke deaths as you move down from 3,000 to 2,000 to 1,500. Yes, lowering to 1,500. But as you go from 1,500 to 1,000, you see tremendous further reduction in heart attack and stroke deaths. If they're going to use a recommendation, might as well use the best recommendation. But they decided on the 1,500 recommendation because they thought it was too hard for people to follow the ideal recommendations. Let them decide that. I've gotten this criticism my whole life. When I, even when I wrote the book Eat to Live in 2000, written in the early 2000s, published, first published in 2004, the book publisher, Little Brown, said, make it, water it down, make this, you'll make more money, you'll sell millions of books and make it so it's more acceptable for people and not so strict. 
And I said, but that's not the, but then you're selling out all the people that want to know what to do, what's best. Why should you water it down so you're keeping people sick? What if a person wants to get well all the way and indeed watering it down, they're not going to get well all the way? You can't do that. You have to tell people what's best. And then if they want not to do it, it was their top decision not to do it all the way. You can't paternalistically tell them to do something that you think they're going to have an easier time doing and it's not best for them to do it. And then you people who are really sick and need the most aggressive chance to reverse it, you sold all those people out and you told them they, and you prevented them from getting well. So this is what the cardiologists are doing by recommending the DASH diet or the 1,500 milligrams of salt. But my point is that why don't we recommend that? Even if they believe that, then it shouldn't be cardiologists recommending it. And my objection also was that doctors shouldn't be the source of nutritional information. Everybody says, how do you get your doctor to learn this? How do you get your doctor to learn that? Why don't doctors learn more about nutrition? I'm saying, why is that the relevant question? Why should doctors know about nutrition anyway? They're treating people who are really sick after serious diseases at the end of their lives, except for an accident or, a, or a, you know, where they're putting something together. These are nutritionally related diseases. It shouldn't be, the, shouldn't be doctors treating nutritionally related diseases. It should be, they should never be developed in the beginning, first place. That means this has to be reading, writing, arithmetic, and nutritional science taught in grade schools. And it's the job of, school, of the school system, the educational system, the government, of the librarians, the truck drivers, the, the, the plumbers, the electricians, and the mailman should be just as versed in nutrition as doctors are. Doctors shouldn't be the, the shouldn't be a whole. Can you imagine coming to a medical visit after you've made yourself sick for four, 50 or 60 years, and then they're telling you to start to eat healthfully to change it? That's ridiculous.